Thank you, and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to speak uh, to um, international audience and uh, connected with so many people. Uh, so the my talk I found in my work in, in recent work that uh, there's a common theme that keeps reappearing in a lot of things that I've been thinking about recently. And uh, from one perspective, uh, this idea of height functions and local height functions associated to closed subschemes keeps popping up in uh, one manner or another. And so I, I thought I'd give a talk kind of talking about this theme in various ways that it appears and is being used in, in some recent work. Okay, so I'm gonna start off just going through kind of the classical theory before we get to uh, how to generalize this to closed subschemes. So to begin, uh, recall that the, the height of a rational number uh, written in reduced form, so the, the GCD of the numerator and the denominator is one, is simply the max of the absolute values of the numerator and the denominator. And uh, it turns out to be a little bit more convenient to work with the logarithm of this quantity. And so uh, we'll work throughout with this logarithmic height and, and generalizations of, uh, of this quantity. And one way to think about the height is it's some kind of arithmetic notion of the, the size of the rational number, um, or some, I guess, some physical notion if you look at the number of digits in the, the numerator. Okay, on projective space, we can define, uh, we can extend this quantity. If you write your point with integer coordinates uh, such that there's no common divisor among the coordinates, then again, the, the height is simply the log of the max of the absolute values of the coordinates. And we can think of the, the height of a uh, rational number as related to this height, if you think of the affine line in, in P1, uh, and so it's, it's related to this uh, projective height. Alternatively, another way to write the height is if you let um, MQ be the, the set of places of Q, so we have uh, a p-adic absolute value for every prime, and we have the infinite or Archimedean place with the, the usual absolute value, then you can write the height in this form. If you normalize the coordinates as above so that there's no common divisor, then all of the, the sum is trivial except for the Archimedean, the usual absolute value. And so this, this is the same thing as the, the height at the top, uh, but the advantage of writing it in this form is that you don't have to normalize the coordinates. This would work for any choice of uh, homogeneous coordinates where the coordinates are integers. Uh, and that follows from what's called the product formula that the product of the, uh, over all of the absolute values is, is one, which follows easily from, from say unique parameters. Okay, so uh, more generally, this is all over the, the rational numbers. We have K as a number field and in K is the set of places of K. This is uh, equivalence classes of, of absolute values. And then for each uh, place, I'm going to choose uh, an absolute value that's normalized in, in a convenient way. Uh, it's not going to be so important, but uh, I'm going to stick into the normalization, these factors like one over the degree of the number of fields, so that when I use this, everything works out to be the absolute height. And with so with the right normalization of the absolute values, then the height over number field is given by the similar formula where uh, Q is replaced by, by K generally, and it's a log of max of these absolute values on, on projective space. Okay, so more generally, there's a machinery to associate a height to a divisor on a projective variety, and the height satisfies certain nice properties. So the height that we've been talking about on projective space is uh, just the height with respect to a hyperplane. Uh, in fact, for, for any hyperplane, you get the same thing up to a bounded function. Uh, it satisfies some functoriality properties where the, the, if you take the height with respect to a divisor and you have a morphism relating the varieties, then the height with respect to the pullback is related to the height uh, with respect to the divisor. Uh, it satisfies a nice linearity property. Uh, and in fact, these first three properties already, uh, you can show determine the, the whole theory. Uh, moreover, you also have a, a, an important fact that uh, it's preserved under linear equivalence of divisors, 
or from another point of view, uh, you can attach a height to uh, line bundles. Okay, so we have all of these uh, nice properties and the, the classical theory of this uh, Vey height machine. And the next thing we want to do is uh, talk about how this classical theory extends to uh, higher co-dimensional objects. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, sorry. First, let me talk about local heights. Uh, so for, you can also define a local height for each uh, place of your number field. And the intuition is roughly that the local height should be the negative log of the viatic distance from your, the point to your divisor, uh, assuming say it's an infected divisor. And so uh, with this negative log of the distance, this means that this local height is large when your point is viatically close uh, to the divisor D. And these local heights also satisfy uh, functoriality and additivity properties. And of course, the whole point of these local heights uh, with, in respect to the global heights is that you can decompose your global height into a sum of, of these local heights, at least outside of the, the support of your. Um, let me just emphasize that the, the global heights depend only on the linear equivalence of D. But these local heights, they really depend on, on the divisor in a strong way. You know, there, there's some kind of distance to the divisor. And so they're definitely are not, uh, definitely depend exactly on the divisor, not just some linear equivalence. Okay, so what, what do these look like? So let me give the kind of easiest example on PN. So if you have a hypersurface defined by some degree D homogeneous polynomial, then uh, a local height function with respect to this hypersurface and V uh, is given by the following formula. You take the log of the max of the coordinates to the dth power. Uh, so things will be invariant under uh, how you choose coordinates with the, since F has degree D. And you divide by the absolute value of um, F evaluated at your point. And so you can see that uh, since F defines D, if your point is close to D, that means that F of P should be small. And so indeed, this is going to be large when your point is, is close to D. Okay, so it is capturing some kind of uh, negative log of the distance. Uh, just to relate things back, if you sum over all these local places, then the, the product formula for a number field K tells you that the denominator there, the, the F of X not to Xn is going to vanish when you, when you take the sum over all places. And you're just left with the numerator and you get D times the usual projective height, uh, which agrees with the fact that uh, the divisor D is D times a hyperplane. And so if you believe the stuff I said about linear equivalence, uh, you should believe that this gives you D times the, the projective height. Okay, so anyway, for, for hypersurfaces, which maybe are one of the uh, more basic situations that we'll consider, it's just given by this very explicit easy formula. Okay, so that's the classical theory in a very, very quick nutshell. And now we're, we're gonna uh, go to uh, setting of closed subschemes. So let me describe uh, if closed subschemes are a, a scary object, let me make it a little bit uh, less scary. So divisors are, are co-dimension one objects. And now we want to do this in, in higher co-dimensions, say attach a height to uh, just a point or, or a curve on a, a higher dimensional variety. And so a, a close, close subscheme of variety is roughly a closed subset with some kind of uh, scheme structure on it. Uh, another way to think about it is that the closed subschemes are in bijection with quasi-coherent sheaves of ideals on X. And that looks like a, um, uh, a mouthful, but it's really just the kind of sheafification of ideals. If, if you wanna to try to make sense of that, it's a way of giving an ideal on a, um, on a variety. Uh, in the simplest case where you're on affine space, then closed subschemes are just in bijec bijection with ideals in the polynomial ring. And the way that you get a closed subscheme out of the ideal is you look at uh, the vanishing set of the ideal, like you typically do in algebraic geometry, and then you put some scheme structure on it that reflects the ideal and it, it's spec of uh, R mod I. Um, anyway, depending on your algebraic geometry background, it's a way to um, talk about the, the set that the ideal defines in affine space with some scheme structure that, that reflects the, the ideal. 
Okay, and on projected space, there's a similar story where we can think about things in terms of ideals. Uh, you have to, there's a bijection with uh, saturated homogeneous ideals. Uh, I don't want to get into details, but just that you can also think of these things as being um, objects that you get associated to ideals uh, that, that are Okay, then we want to do operations with closed subschemes. And so the a convenient way to do that is to talk about what happens on the ideal side. And so the, this is with ideal sheaves, but if you want to think about AN or PN, this is just operations with ideals. And so the, I, the closed subscheme that we're going to define uh, the sum to be the, the closed subscheme associated to the product of the ideal sheaves. And the intersection corresponds to the, the sum of the, the ideal sheaves. So we can uh, construct, we can, we can define these operations by looking at the ideals. Uh, we say that the closed subscheme Y is contained in X if you get, have a corresponding relation between the ideal sheaves and the uh, order reverses because you're looking at where the ideal vanishes. Uh, we're also gonna wanna talk about uh, functoriality. And so you can also define the pullback of a closed subscheme. And this is the, the definition, uh, what happens on ideal sheaves. Uh, if you don't know what this means, it, it's just the natural scheme that you get by taking the pre-image and putting the natural scheme structure on it. Um, confusingly, this is not the same ideal sheaf as the pullback of I sub X because that's not generally an ideal sheaf, but uh, anyway, for people that know this, um, Okay, so uh, Silverman then uh, defined heights associated to closed subschemes, uh, generalizing the case for divisors, and they satisfy up to bounded functions. So everything is up to bounded functions unless you have some uh, uh, group action or something to normalize things. And so um, I may accidentally omit an O of one in places, but everything is basically up to O of one always. Uh, so the, the theory agrees with the classical case when the it's a divisor that you view as a, as a closed subscheme. Uh, you have additivity, just as you did with divisors. You have functoriality in the, the same way that you do uh, with, with divisors. If X is a closed subscheme uh, that's contained in Y, then you get a corresponding relationship between the, the heights. And in fact, even if the support of one is contained in the support of the other, the support is just the, the closed subset associated to the closed subscheme, then you get that one height is bounded by a, a constant times the other. This is some kind of height version of the null Okay. Uh, similarly, you can also define local heights. And in fact, I'm doing it a bit backwards here. And in Silverman's paper, he starts with the local heights and then gives the, the global heights. But um, anyway, the you can define local heights uh, and Again, the global height decomposes as a sum of the local heights. And they, they satisfy the same properties and additivity, functoriality, and, and, and so on. Uh, additionally, and this is going to be an important uh, property, up to a banded function, one way to think about these is that the intersection of two closed subschemes, uh, the height, the local height associated to that corresponds to the minimum of the, the, the local heights on, on X and Y. Um, this is only for this local height. It doesn't work for the global heights. And that's just because the, the sum of minimums is not the same as the minimum of the sums. You know, you, the min may be taken at uh, AI or BI depending on I. And so uh, you only get an inequality if you look at the, the global heights. Okay. Anyway, the intersection corresponds to the, to the minimums. The, uh, Quick question. Yes. Is this height uh, a function on Point, algebraic points of the variety. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. Um, so generally speaking, we'll, uh, we'll think about it as, you know, you can all, we'll always, uh, we'll be interested in primarily rational points. And so uh, if you want something that's over some other field, uh, we'll typically just take a, uh, an extension and, and work over the larger uh, But yeah, you, you can do everything over the, over the algebra. Okay, so I want to talk about um, ways to interpret these heights, and there are at least four interpretations that all uh, are useful and we'll, we'll see um, used in various ways. So the, the first interpretation is as a 
distance function. So it still holds that when X is a closed subscheme, that you can think of this as giving negative the log of the, the viatic distance between a point and uh, your closed subscheme. Another way to view it is as a minimum of local heights. So if you want to reduce everything to divisors, uh, you can do this. You can always write a closed subscheme as an intersection of uh, effective divisors. And then you have the formula that the, the closed subscheme is just the, the minimum of those uh, heights attached to the divisors. Uh, so in this way, there, there's nothing new. Everything is coming from divisors. Uh, but we'll see. I, I think there's a, a, a it gives a, a deeper intuition to, to use um, this machinery. OK, so we, we can think of things as um, these heights as bookkeeping devices if you like to keep track of, of minimums of, of classical heights. But another way to think about it. Uh, yet another way is to relate things to greatest common divisors. So let's look in detail what happens when you're working with hypersurfaces. And for simplicity, let me take them to be the same degree. Then if you look at this uh, min construction uh, or min property that I mentioned, that will correspond to a max in the denominator. And you get that the um, height of the intersection of two hypersurfaces of the same degree is given by this formula where you, where you have a max of uh, the two defining polynomials in the denominator. Let me simplify this. If we work over the integers and let me normalize things so that uh, the coordinates are, are co-prime, then for any uh, prime, if I, if I look at the p-adic height, the numerator up top is going to be uh, one because I'm assuming there, there's no common divisor. And so I'm just left with the denominator. And so we just get this simple formula that it's negative log max of F1 and F2 evaluated at your uh, tuple. And then in this case, if you uh, sum over all of the, the non-Archimedean places over all the, the p-adic absolute values, if you think about this negative log max, it's picking off the uh, p part of the greatest common divisor when you, when you do this. And when you sum over all of these, you just get exactly the logarithm of the GCD of F1 evaluated at the point and F2 evaluated. And so if I look at the full height, which also has an Archimedean contribution, uh, it's some kind of generalization of the logarithm of the GCD of F1 evaluated at your point and F2 evaluated. So uh, this is gonna be a, an important point of view is that there, there, these heights of the higher co-dimensional objects, they correspond to some kind of GCD. Okay, and just to record now, later um, we'll talk about the uh, generalized greatest common divisor. And this is a, a formula for it that coincides with the, the usual GCD uh, when everything's an integer. It's some extension to, to number flows more, more generally. OK, a fourth way to think about things is that these are about heights associated to exceptional divisors. So if I, if I have a closed subscheme, then there's a, you can blow up along your, your closed subscheme, and you get a variety uh, x tilde, and you have an associated exceptional divisor, which is just the, the pullback of your, your closed subscheme. And uh, that turns out to always be a Cartier divisor. That's kind of the um, uh, universal property of blowing up is that it's, it's minimal with, with this property. And then now if I look at the height with respect to this exceptional divisor, by functoriality, I see that it's the same thing as the height with respect to this closed subscheme uh, downstairs. And so uh, another way to view these heights for closed subschemes is again, they come from divisors. You can always reduce to the theory of divisors by uh, blowing up appropriately. Uh, but again, I think it gives some insight into, uh, on the one hand, the heights with respect to these closed subschemes, but also what the heights with respect to exceptional divisors look like. Uh, and so uh, this is another, another nice connection uh, that we'll, we'll see is useful. Okay, so the uh, first set of results I'm going to talk about are related to this uh, greatest common divisor point of view. So um, let me first give, give some motivation for things coming from Voida's conjecture. So uh, we'll have a, a project, smooth projective variety X, uh, some data. K, capital K will always note the canonical divisor. Then uh, a very special case of Voigt's conjecture is that 
you have this inequality for the height associated to the canonical divisor, that it's less than epsilon times some ample height, at least outside of some uh, closed subset. Uh, qualitatively, what this inequality is saying, uh, one consequence of it is that if your variety is of general type, uh, that means that the canonical divisor is a big divisor, then uh, from Northcott's theorem for big divisors, this tells you that on a variety of general type, rational points should not be these risk limits. And in other words, uh, this is a quantitative version of the, the Bombieri language. Okay, now what happens if your canonical divisor is trivial? So like a, a K3 surface or an abelian variety, then this inequality doesn't really tell you anything because the height is just uh, a, a bounded function. And that's not really surprising. In this case, it's believed that rational points are potentially dense. Uh, of course, this is a, an open problem, say for, uh, for K3 surfaces, uh, but uh, the, the rational point should be dense and there's a more general set of conjectures due to Camp Campana that explains uh, when this kind of thing should happen. Uh, but in particular, it should happen when the canonical divisor is trivial. Okay, uh, the reason why I'm talking about this is there is a kind of a surprising way in this situation to, uh, I would say, get something from nothing. Uh, this because this inequality looks trivial in this case. Uh, so how do you do this? Um, let me take a, a sub-variety of your variety X that has the trivial canonical divisor, and let me blow up along the closed subscale. Then there's a well-known relation between the canonical divisors when you blow up in this situation. Uh, it's given by the, the pullback of the canonical divisor downstairs plus some uh, multiplicity times the exceptional divisor. And with our assumptions, the canonical divisor is zero. And so we just get some multiple of the exceptional divisors, the canonical divisor upstairs. But now if I apply Voyage conjecture upstairs, I get that the exceptional divisor is bounded by uh, some kind of big height. And then using functorality, you get that the height with respect to this closed subscheme should be bounded by an ample height outside of some uh, closed subscheme. Okay, and this is, especially meaningful in this case where the canonical divisor is, divisor is trivial because you should have a dense set of rational points. And so the, this is really telling you something about uh, heights with respect to these higher co-dimension closed subschemes uh, on, on such a variety that uh, some fact about uh, GCDs on, on, on this variety. Okay, and um, I, I, it's, a, it's a bit magical that you, you, can, you can get something kind of extra from Voigt's conjecture uh, by blowing up, but that's, that's what happens. Okay, a, a simple case of this is, let's, let's take an elliptic curve and uh, a point uh, in, in say, uh, Firestrash form and a, a point x, y on it. And let me write the, the point in as a, a fraction. And then let me look on, on the product of the elliptic curve with itself and look at the close up scheme being the origin then if you believe what I've been saying, this should correspond to some kind of GCD. And it's exactly, it says exactly the following, that the, the height of the, uh, with respect to Y of this pair PQ on this uh, square uh, is the log of the GCD of the denominators of the, the points P and Q, and that it should be bounded by the, the height of these points uh, outside of some uh, special curves in, in this abelian surface. And so you, 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 out of this conjecture, you get these kinds of um, very interesting uh, inequalities involving GCDs. Okay, this is all conjectural, you know, conjectural on Boyce conjecture. And so th this particular problem for, even for E cross with itself seems, uh, I've thought about it some, it seems rather difficult. Uh, there's some work of uh, David McKinnon when E has rank one or rank one over the endomorphism ring. Uh, there are also some results over function fields, but I would say in general, it's, uh, it, it seems like a hard problem. Um, even more so if you, if you look at a, a, an abelian surface that's not uh, uh, split. Okay, now the, the same argument from Voigtus conjecture, which I won't go through, works also if you work with integral points on uh, an open subset of a projective variety given by some complement of a divisor, and again, for simplicity, I'll assume that the uh, canonical divisor plus the boundary is, is trivial. And there's some technical assumptions. You need your closed subscheme y to intersect your divisor in some uh, nice way. 
Uh, more generally, you get things out of Voyage conjecture, you get some kind of refined uh, set of inequalities, and this was worked out by, by Silverman in a nice paper about uh, GCDs connecting all of this. Let me take the, the uh, case of uh, a power of, of GM, which we can think of in one model as PN minus the coordinate hyperplanes. So here there's a, a group structure where you multiply uh, your n tuples coordinate wise. And the log canonical divisor here is trivial. The, from this compactification, the canonical divisor in PN is negative n plus one times a hyperplane. And so when we add the boundary, uh, we, we get a, a trivial canonical log canonical divisor. And integral points here are just uh, n tuples of units, of, of s units. Right, so I, I haven't defined integral points, but I'll just tell you what it is uh, in this situation. And so if you follow the um, previous setup from Boyce conjecture, you should expect that uh, certain kinds of GCD inequalities hold when you, uh, on, this, um, on this right. So uh, let me give the, the story for, for this setting where we can prove some things. Uh, so I, I'm going a bit backwards. This is a, a viewpoint from after these results were known, but uh, the, the starting point goes back to a uh, result of Bijor, Corbea, and Zanier. And they showed that if A and B are multiplicatively independent integers, then you have the following uh, inequality for the logarithmic GCD, that the GCD of A to the n minus one and B to the n minus one uh, should be bounded by epsilon times n for all but finitely many uh, positive integers. A. And so it's a, a you know, very nice uh, elementary looking inequality that, that has a lot of depth to, to, to the proof and to the, the, the theory behind it. Uh, how is this connected to the point of view of units? Well, a to the n and b to the n are units when you put some primes into your set S. And so this is really about the logarithm of the logarithmic GCD of u minus one and v minus one where, where u and v are, are S units. And in, in some, uh, and this corresponds to uh, this height with respect to the point one, one, that's the minus one, minus one up there uh, on, whoops, I put GM to the end, that should be GM squared. Uh, this is the, the two dimensional case uh, in, in P2. And so, uh, you know, you have this very elementary looking statement uh, and on the geometric side, it corresponds to this height with respect to a point on GM squared. Okay, then uh, they proved a, a general result for polynomials in U and V, uh, which on, on GM squared. And uh, I extended the result in, in for N gray equal to three, they proved the, the N equal two case of the following theorem. Uh, so it, it's a bit long, but the, instead of working with units, it's equivalent really to work with a finitely generated group in, in GM and a Q bar. Uh, such a group will always be a group of S units over some number field. Uh, the coordinates will be estimates in, in some number field. And we need some non-vanishing condition at the origin for the, the polynomials. That's some kind of um, general position condition. And then we get uh, this inequality that says that the logarithm of the GCD of these polynomials evaluated at these unit points uh, is bounded by uh, epsilon times, the, times some height. Outside of some exceptional set, which in this setting you can take to be uh, translates of, of sub -tour. Okay, so, um, it's a, it's, but uh, anyway, if, you're, if you can't follow the, the statement, it's a generalization of the a to the n minus one, b to the n minus one on the previous slide, uh, but in more variables. Okay, a height version of this theorem, it's not quite equivalent, but it's very closely related is uh, that this is really saying something about heights with respect to uh, closed subschemes of co-dimension at least two. Uh, the connection is that if you're looking at the uh, GCD of these polynomials F and G, then the closed subscheme defined by F and G is, is where the, the connection is. And so uh, another way to formulate this in terms of heights is that all of this is giving a bound for this height with respect to a closed subscheme on uh, of co-dimension at least two on, on, on PN. Uh, with respect to these integral points on, on GM to the N, which again, you can think of as uh, intuples of units. Okay, so there's a, a, height, a height formulation of, of, of the theorem. Okay, uh, key ingredient in the proof is the, the subspace theorem, and I'll, I'll say more about that later. 
Uh, let me just mention some more recent work in this direction. So uh, Yasufuku and Wang gave a, a different proof of this inequality uh, using Ruvoidus inequality and relaxed some of the hypotheses a bit, uh, proving it in a more general setting. Uh, my PhD student, Jing Xiao, uh, has some work uh, that relaxes the unity condition. So in fact, you don't really need the points to be units. They can just be close to a unit in a, in a precise sense. And so you can extend this inequality to rational points uh, with some uh, penalty. If you, if you choose a fixed epsilon, then, then, you, then you, you can specify how close they need to be to a, a, a unit for joy. Uh, other work, uh, Keping Huang and I, uh, a postdoc at MSU, uh, also extended the Yasufuku Wang result to um, an even more general setting. Uh, instead of going through the subspace machinery or the avoid inequality, uh, we use some geometry and the, the result on uh, GM to the N. Uh, this is a work in progress that hasn't, hasn't developed. Okay, so um, let me go back to the subspace theorem and mention some connections with uh, closed subschemes in the subspace theorem. So to start, let me go back to the, the basic theorem and the line of results I want to consider, which is Roth's theorem. And Roth's theorem tells one how closely you can approximate some algebraic number by a rational number in terms of the denominator. And so it says that uh, uh, with finite mean exceptions, you can't get closer than one over the denominator squared plus, uh, well, times the denominator to the epsilon, the famous uh, result. And then Rostam, you can write in a more general form over number fields and including uh, non-Archimedean absolute values. And this is a, a height formulation of the of Ross theorem uh, due to write out in Lang. And the, the form of the theorem, which is going to be a model for uh, some things we'll talk about later, is that on the left-hand side, you have a sum of local heights. And the right-hand side, you have some constant times a global height. And the Ross theorem is giving you some uh, inequality between the two. Yeah, so the sum of local heights is bounded by uh, 2 plus epsilon times the height on, on P. And uh, th this is um, just a, a reformulation in the height. Okay, then uh, Schmidt generalized this whole thing from the projective line to uh, projective space and hyperplanes. And Schlokove uh, proved the general form where, again, you allow uh, non Archimedean absolute values. And here's the statement. If you're not familiar with it, it's probably going to be too much to take in. But let me just say the, the left hand side is, again, it's some sum of local heights attached to hyperplanes is bounded by some constant times of global height. And it happens to be that uh, n plus 1, which is related to the canonical divisor, is, is the right number. Um, there, are, okay, there are many important aspects of this, but uh, the hyperplanes have to be in general position. You can change them with the place v. And they're all very important, but uh, I don't want to get bogged down into uh, explaining all the, all the details uh, about them. Uh, another important aspect is that the exceptional set consists of hyperplanes, uh, hence the, the subspace in the, in the name. Okay, and then uh, the story is that this has been, was generalized to hypersurfaces, or uh, another way to think about it is more generally, uh, it can be generalized to linear, linearly equivalent divisors on a projective variety. And so there are, uh, Theorems of Everett Sofredi and Corbyas in, in this uh, direction. And since I think the subspace theorem already is a, a lot to take in, I don't want to restate the theorems, but it's a, an analogous result for uh, hypersurfaces or, or more generally these linearly equivalent divisors. And uh, what I really want to want to talk about is how you can use closed subschemes to understand these things. So uh, this will be a, a closed subscheme perspective on, on such uh, inequalities. And so uh, what's the key idea, the key relation? Uh, so suppose we have effective divisors D1 to Dn, and I'm looking at one of these local uh, sums of local heights. So uh, I'm going to fix my point P, and I'm looking at the sums of these local heights attached to these divisors uh, Di. Uh, typically, in here would be the dimension of a variable. Okay, so if I'm fixing my point, after re-indexing, I can assume my local heights are ordered. 
in, in this way. This depends on P, of course, but I, I'm going to fix my, my point P and uh, re-index things so I have this ordering on the local heights. And then now here's the, the basic trick. If I order them in this way, then if I look at the min of these height functions at some point and you use the machinery of closed subschemes, we get that the, this local height attached to the ith one is the min of the, pre, the um, previous guys. And from the closed subscheme machinery, this is the same as the height associated to the intersection of, the, of these divisors. And so if I set yi to be the intersection of these first i divisors, then I see that my um, sum of these local heights with respect to these divisors, it's equivalent to a sum of heights with respect to closed subschemes where you have these nested closed subschemes given by these intersections. Uh, so the, the trick here is that we replace the sum of local heights of divisors by this equivalent sum of local heights of these nested closed subschemes. Um, in the subspace theorem, what you're doing is uh, you have all these hyperplanes and you get this like flag of hyperplanes you know, that's re replaced by these linear subspaces of um, where the dimension goes down uh, uh, each time. Uh, generally, if, the, if you assume the divisors take ample in general position, then the, these y sub i's will go down in dimension by, by one each time. Okay, and so it, it's, it's a trade-off. On one hand, the closed subscheme machinery is maybe um, uh, more complicated from a certain point of view. On the other hand, uh, they have smaller dimension, and so some things work better uh, from this point of view. One reason why I think it's important to uh, look at this kind of thing is that when you're only at the level of divisors, it's kind of hard to make use of information about how the divisors intersect. And so, for instance, the um, a lot of these theorems, like the Erbozzo Freddy Corbaia Zania theorems, they don't really see the intersections. They work just as long as you have some general position condition. Whereas here, the closed subschemes capture information about how the divisors intersect um, in an important way. And so the right-hand side, when you rewrite things in terms of these closed subschemes, it contains a lot of information about the intersections that you might hope to leverage in, in arguments. Uh, more generally, I think because of this uh, connection, it makes sense to study uh, diaphragmatic approximation in the setting where, where you try to prove results more generally about uh, closed subschemes. Okay, so in, in this direction, uh, Gordon Heyer and I proved a version of uh, Schmidt's theorem for closed subschemes. And uh, the setup is similar. At each place, you have some closed subschemes that are in general position with an appropriate notion. And they appear with some uh, coefficient on the left-hand side uh, that I'll describe. Uh, it's, it's a so-called Sushadri constant. Uh, if you know what that is, then um, you can uh, generalize the classical Shashadri constant to closed subschemes, and I've given the definition. Uh, but um, if you don't know, it's just you have to, you have to put in some uh, coefficient, some natural coefficient for equality to, to hold. Uh, I'll describe what it is in a, in a simple setting in a, in a moment. Uh, but anyway, this is some kind of analog of the subspace theorem uh, for, for closed subschemes on, on, on the left-hand side. Uh, what are these Shashadri constants about? So if you're in the situation where your ample divisor on the right is a hyperplane, and y is a hypersurface of degree d, then this is simply uh, the coefficient is 1 over the degree. And if you uh, know the, the, these theorems about, uh, that hold for hypersurfaces, they all have some kind of normalizing factor where you normalize by the degree. And so it's nothing more than this natural coefficient uh, in, in those theorems uh, in, in this case. Um, I feel for completeness, I need to say what the general position means. Uh, the, it, it means the following, that the, the co-dimension behaves in a, the co-dimension of the intersections behaves in a, a natural way. Uh, it's a bit counterintuitive in some ways. So like if you have a point and you look at this definition, you can repeat it a bunch of times, which doesn't seem very general position, but uh, is general position for, for this. Um, Prior to our work on this theorem, there was uh, the case of points is essentially equivalent to a result of McKinnon and Roth. And uh, prior to our work, there was work of Ru and Wang. And there's more recent work of Ru and Wang and Voida, where they replaced the Shashadri constants by 
uh, these so-called beta constants, which I'm not going to define, but uh, if you know what they are, uh, there are some uh, recent papers that uh, improve our, our result by uh, replacing these Chaudhry constants by these, these beta constants. Okay, um, then the, the last thing I want to talk about is some uh, current work, or uh, this section could probably be subtitled work that would have been finished a year ago if it weren't for a once in a century pandemic uh, throwing life into chaos. But uh, right now it is current work. Uh, one of the uh, projects that I'm pursuing has to do with what's called the Nachka-Ruwan theorem. Uh, and this is a generalization of the subspace theorem to hyperplanes that are in uh, M subgeneral position. So M subgeneral position is a relaxation of the general position condition where you require only that um, M of the hyperplanes intersect at a, at a point, at most M intersect at a point. Uh, so this, this is a, a, an important generalization of the subspace theorem where you weaken the general position hypothesis. Uh, the proof of this theorem uses this uh, combinatorial machinery uh, that's named after Nachka, these Nachka weights that you attach to uh, your set of hyperplanes and the proof seems uh, rather specific to hyperplanes. So the machinery you use seems to not generalize in a straightforward way to hypersurfaces. And so uh, proving a version of this theorem for hypersurfaces is, is uh, open. Uh, in work in progress with, with Gordon Heyer, we proved some kind of uh, version of the subspace theorem for closed subschemes in M subgeneral position. And I uh, well, first, it's work in progress, but also the statement is rather technical, so uh, I'll, I'll just say that it's, it's some version of this for um, M subgeneral position. And even though it's about closed subschemes, uh, you can apply it to the case of divisors. So again, if you're only interested in divisors, it's still, I think, um, crucial to, to think about this machinery. And uh, we've made some... some uh, substantial progress towards proving an analog of the Nachka-Ruwan theorem for uh, in a general setting, which includes hypersurfaces on projective space. Um, and, and essential to these arguments is really this trick of replacing a sum of local heights by this equivalent sum of local heights of these nested closed subschemes. And so the, this closed subscheme perspective, uh, even for this theorem that's just only about divisors, uh, seems to really give a, a lot of insight in, in um, how, to, how, to, how to approach this, this problem. Okay, the other project that I want to mention is uh, uh, another work of Povai and Zanier. Uh, for most of my talks, I could probably randomly label my slides Povai and Zanier and it would make sense. Uh, so here the, the problem uh, that they looked at was this equation f of a to the m y equals b to the n where uh, y is an integer and a and b are fixed integers and the key thing is that they're not co-prime they, they share some uh, common divisor and as a, a amusing application they mentioned that you could use their study of this equation to uh, solve the problem uh, of when a square has three non-zero digits to, to classify the, the solutions that there's some infinite families um, and finitely many, uh, along with finitely many solutions. Uh, there is uh, a lot of other work on this kind of problem where you're looking at uh, squares or powers that have few digits, and I'm not going to be able to uh, mention them, mention all of them, but uh, Mike Bennett has some, some work on this, and uh, it's, it's very neat stuff. Uh, the, what I want to mention is um, the, the more general problem, this f of a to the m y equals b to the n, uh, in joint work with uh, Huang and Xiao, we have a uh, kind of a new perspective on, on this equation, uh, including some higher dimensional versions of, uh, of this kind of um, Diophantine equation. So for instance, if you look at squares with a fixed number of non-zero digits, uh, so more than three digits, then uh, when you apply these techniques, you can say something about the uh, two smallest exponents and the two largest exponents. You, you don't get a fully uh, uh, satis satisfying theorem, but it at least puts some constraints on the uh, smallest and largest exponents. And um, 
let me just say that uh, I find it kind of funny that in this analysis, the Archimedean GCD uh, gives you information. Uh, so the Archimedean GCD is typically, it's large when you have some uh, polynomials that take small values in, in the, the, the Archimedean instance. Uh, what does this all have to do with what I'm talking about? Well, geometrically, this kind of question is related to studying uh, height bands for closed subschemes where uh, your subscheme Y is on your divisor D. So this is a situation that's not quite contained in the um, previous results that I was discussing. There, your subscheme doesn't intersect your divisor in, in a nice way. Uh, in this case, your, your subscheme is on the divisor or say uh, is a point on the divisor at maybe a nasty point of uh, intersection of the, the components. Uh, and uh, again, the, the, these arguments for studying this, the closed subscheme machinery is really crucial to uh, constructing the arguments and, and figuring out uh, uh, geometrically what, what's going on. Um, so, yeah, I, um, you know, Corvai and Zanier had, a, had a, a different method, and this is kind of trying to recast it in this uh, closed subscheme framework and get some arguments that are, um, uh, from some point of view, uh, rely on some geometry of the, the, the closed subschemes that, that appear uh, in, in, in this problem. Um, okay, so I, that's the, the last thing I want to say in the, the new projects I, I didn't get very many details for, but uh, I guess my overarching point is just that uh, I think the closed subscheme machinery, um, it's more than just a, a, a bookkeeping device. It can really give you some insight into the geometry of things uh, and help you come up with new arguments to uh, tackle some of these problems, even if you're only interested about uh, uh, divisors, ultimately, uh, this translation to, into this world is, is useful. Um, Okay, so I, I think I'll uh, stop, stop there.